Before we get into the word, let's have a word of prayer. God in heaven, thank you for this opportunity to worship you this day. And Lord, we just pray that as we continue our study of the third angel's message, that you help us to see um, the wonderful things you have shown in scripture about how we can live in the time of the end. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're going to be in Revelation 14 again. I'll let you get there. Revelation 14. Um, this is the third part of a three-part series. Uh, I've covered the first and second angel's message in Revelation 14, um, which starts at Revelation 14, chapter 6. So if you have not seen the first two, I would invite you to go online and view those. They're available on our church's YouTube page. Um, so I won't be going over everything with those two, obviously, but I just want to give a quick reminder for people that we are looking at Revelation through the historicism lens, and we have identified that this three angels message is specifically given um, in what's considered the last days, which is the period of time after, we believe prophetically, 1844, when in the book of Daniel, the cleansing of the sanctuary begins at the end of the 2300-day prophecy. Um, again, we believe there is a heavenly sanctuary in heaven, that time passes in heaven, and we believe that Jesus Christ is our high priest who is ministering in there. So I just want to get that out of the way, um, because I know there are different ways to look at Revelation. Again, I invite you to go back and look at the previous sermons if you have some more questions. I kind of cover a little bit more in some of those. But we're going to be focusing on the third angel's message, which starts at verse 9. So this says, Then a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and his image and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever, and they have no rest, day or night, who worship the beast and his image, and whoever receives the mark of his name. So, this is the third angel's message, and it is much, much more intense than the previous two. The last one that I preached about, about Babylon has fallen, has fallen, that one was a little bit of a, an interesting study, I think, of looking at what exactly is Babylon. We describe that as Babylon being the end-time confederacy of the dragon, the sea beast, and the earth beast. And how we talked about that the whole issue when it comes to the end of days is about worship. About who are you worshiping. So what you have with the third angel's message is this is a message that while we can preach it now has not reached the fullness of its urgency. And if you're like, what do you mean by that? Because the first part, if anyone worships the beast and his image and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. In order to understand what exactly are you talking about, the beast and his image and the mark, it's actually in chapter 13 when you're talking about the beast from the earth. And what's interesting here is that it says in Revelation 13... And I'm going to be starting at verse 11. It says, Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb and spoke like a dragon. And he exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence and causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. He performs great signs so that even, he even makes fire come down from heaven on earth in the sight of men. And he deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. He was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should speak and cause as many would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. He causes all 
both great and small, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads, and that no one may buy or sell except one that has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. That is a lot of stuff. That is a lot. Again, we're jumping into Revelation, but in order to understand, again, I identified the beast from the earth was the United States the last time I was here. That itself could be a study, and that we identified that the first beast that it was talking about was the beast from the sea, which is earlier in Revelation 13, which had the seven heads and ten horns, and we identified that the, the iteration of the head of the sea beast at the time of this beast from the earth coming out, we identified as the Roman papacy, and that the wound that was given to it was in 1798 when Napoleon Bonaparte uh, actually dethroned the papacy from its rule. The decline of the papacy from the medieval period had been a steady decline, but we identified in a in a much earlier sermon I did when we were talking about the series on Daniel that the little horn power ruled for a time, but its power would actually not stay forever. It would actually suffer a loss, but eventually there would be a time when that power would be healed. Now, we have not reached that time yet, but what exactly does that have to do with the third angel's message? Well, when we just read about the beast from the earth, the beast from the earth, it said, causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. This has not happened yet. Some people think that when Benito Mussolini reinstated the Vatican, that the wound was healed. And that's the beginning process of a healing. And if you're confused, why am I talking about the papacy? It's because we identified that the end time Babylon power, its false worship is centered around coercion. It's centered around the idea that the worship of God is something that needs to be forced on the conscience. And that if it is not forced on the conscience, if you will not accept it, you will be persecuted. We identified that during the medieval period, when church and state were combined together, we find the greatest expression of this with the Roman papacy power, Inquisition, and the like. But I did make mention that Protestants also were just as heinous in places where church and state were combined. The idea that the worship of God is something that has to be forced on a person, that a person is not free to make a conscious choice for themselves, is the antithesis of what God stands for, which is the ability for a human being to make a conscious choice to worship God. Any time that a church and state are together, they always become a persecuting power. Because they then determine what they consider to be the right worship of God. And if you read your Bible or you know anything about all the denominations of Christianity, you realize that not everybody is in agreement on every point of doctrine. And that can be very problematic. Especially if you tie the blessings of your nation to how people worship God. This beast from the earth, though, again, it says that they exercise authority of the first beast and causes all who dwell to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed, performing great signs so that he even makes fire come down from heaven on earth in the sight of men. Again, this is taking place when the wound is healed. We're not there yet. We're not there yet. And the language scholars have said about the earth beast is that the language that's used describes kind of parallels with the work of the Holy Spirit. End time Babylon, for those who don't know, is a counterfeit of the Trinity of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. With the dragon, the sea beast, and the earth beast. The earth beast acts in the role of the false Holy Spirit. And so what you see here when it says fire coming down from heaven, some scholars have said this describes similar language to Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came down. Some people say it's referring more to Elijah when he's on Mount Carmel. But the, regardless of what it is, it's great signs that are being done in order to give credibility, to give glorification, to turn attention to the beast whose head was healed. Things are going to happen that may give credibility 
to that beast head being healed. We have not had that happen yet. I want to reiterate this. This has not happened yet. But it's clear that it deceives those who dwell on the earth. But then something happens with the earth beast. It says that the earth beast decides to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. And that this image of the beast actually starts to persecute those who would not worship the beast. I want to be very clear that the earth beast is creating the image of the beast. And you're like, I don't understand what you're saying. This is symbolic language. Again, a beast represents a kingdom. I'm not talking about some mythical beast that comes out of the earth and then breathes something. No, we're, this is mythical language, so to speak, symbolic language to help us understand a greater truth. And so you have the language of the Holy Spirit in the sense of, look at verse 15, he was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship his image of the beast to be killed. This is very similar to the idea of the creation of Adam, where God breathes into the nostrils of man and he becomes alive. What happens here is the earth beast is giving life to the image of the beast. So previously, scholars have noted that the earth beast, in order to try to give credibility, glory to the sea beast, is doing it through deceitful miracles and the like. But when the image of the beast is created, it takes a different route. No longer is the image of the beast focusing on miracles. It actually acts as a power that is forceful through coercion. The image of the beast, we would believe in Bible prophecy, is the time period when the earth beast decides to take on the same characteristics of the sea beast, which is the combination of church and state in the United States where the church and state coming together will become a persecuting power of those that act outside of its decrees. And you say, how could that happen? How could that possibly happen? That's impossible to happen. I don't think that church and state in the U.S. coming together is an overnight event. I don't think it's an overnight event. I think that what happens is you have small incremental things that lead to that point. And you go, what are you talking about? I'll just give you a recent example. At the time of this recording, it's June 29th, 2024. I don't know how many of you are aware that in Oklahoma, the superintendent of education has just passed legislation that in all public schools, the Bible must be taught. Now, you may be thinking, that's wonderful. The Bible needs to be taught in schools. Or in Louisiana, the Ten Commandments need to be put into public schools in an area that they can be easily read. That may not seem like much. There's a lawsuit happening with the ACLU of religious liberty being, you know, violated. But you see, that is what you need to be aware of. The U.S. moving to a church and state union is not something that happens overnight. It is a gradual thing. If you push a ball very slowly, but you push it enough times, eventually you look back and you see that from the point that you started to the point you're at, there's a distance. Not only that, in the United States today, you have prominent Christian leaders who are saying that in order to take back the nation for God, we need to legislate the Bible. That for the morality of the nation, you need to legislate the Bible. You need to combat the woke ideology, to combat the leftists, to combat the liberals. We need to take back the country for God. This nation was founded as a Christian nation, and it needs to go back to being a Christian nation. If you've ever heard that, if you've ever heard that, have you noticed how the volume of that language 
has gotten much louder in the last 10 years. With the rise of social media, I grew up in the time of social media just starting out. I can tell you that we are at a point now of extreme radicalization. And so it is no surprise to me that you are starting to see not only speakers, prominent speakers calling for take back the country for God, but you're seeing legislators, people elected, whether to a state position or to a federal position, taking it upon themselves to put forth what they feel is good for the nation for the sake of God. It is a slow process, but take note of when those things are happening. Take note of the rulings. Take note of the case in Oklahoma and Louisiana. Will that make it to the Louisiana Supreme Court? Will it make its way all the way up to the Supreme Court of the United States? I don't know. But the process of the earth beast, which looks like a lamb, but speaks like a dragon. It has the appearance of Christianity, has the appearance of Jesus, but speaks like a dragon. If any person has ever studied U.S. history, I'm going to tell you right now, you can see lamb speak and you can see dragon speak. And it's funny that today there are people that are saying, let's avoid looking at the bad stuff that has happened in the history of this country. Why are we focusing on that? If you are someone who grew up in what's considered a minority home, you are well aware of the effects of the dragon speak that it has had on your family, on your, aunt, on your, your, your parents, on their parents. I'll say it. Slavery was dragon speak in the United States. And if you don't think that slavery has still had an effect on people to this day, you're wrong. It's affected generational wealth. Religious liberty is a characteristic that the United States put into its constitution, put in the idea that all men are free, but did not give it to all men. Were there founders of the country who were Christian? Yes. Do we see elements of Christianity in the founding documents? Yes, you do. But notice how they are not making this an official Christian nation. They are arguing for Christian morals without actually explicitly saying we are Christian. This is a church state. That was what they were trying to avoid. Today, you see people not taking the route that they took. See, that's the hard route. The hard route is talking with people that not necessarily Christian, but you can come to agreements on points of morality. Hence, the Founding Fathers could talk with people that were deist, like a Thomas Jefferson, could even talk with someone like a Thomas Paine, who was absolutely against Christianity, and come to the understanding that we can agree that these certain things are bad. Did they get everything right? No, they didn't. They pushed slavery aside, and a couple generations later, their descendants died on the battlefields during the Civil War. The country almost split. But see, that's the hard work. Today, if you're paying attention, that's not the route that's being taken. The ones that are the most loud calling for church and state to combine in the U.S. do not believe in the same type of morality conversations that the Founding Fathers did. These are men that would say, we need to legislate the Bible and we can come together on common points of doctrines as Christians and say that, yes, we need to take this country back for God. But then when you get the power, who determines which version of Christianity is correct? It's the one that has the most political power. The dragon speak in the United States has always been present. But it becomes more loud. That in and of itself is where you see the callback to the sea beast. But the danger of the earth beast, it creates the image of the beast when it decides to enforce civil penalties from a religious standpoint. The image of the beast 
is when the combination of church and state in the United States happens and it becomes a persecuting power of those that do not fit within the defined roles of what is acceptable. And you may be saying to me, Pastor, again, that sounds pretty far off. Well, I want to read to you very quickly about in Louisiana when they want to put the Ten Commandments in the public school, which it says, signed into law earlier today by Governor Jeff Landry, HB 71 requires schools to display the Ten Commandments in every classroom on a poster or framed document that is at least 11 inches by 14 inches. The commandments must be the central focus of the display and printed in a large, easily readable font. The bill also requires that a specific version of the Ten Commandments, which has been dictated by the state legislature, be used for every display. Displays that depart from state-sanctioned version of Scripture would violate Louisiana law. It's not far-fetched, the idea of church and state legislating what is correct Christianity. This is just a small microchasm. But it is something that becomes more and more prominent if we believe that the earth beast is the United States, if we believe that Bible prophecy is talking about in the three angels' message that this end time Babylon power is going to be louder and louder as time goes on. So, getting back to the third angel's message, if anyone worships the beast in his image and receives his mark on his forehead and his hand, he himself shall also drink the wine of the wrath of God. Well, what is the mark of the beast? Well, following the image of the beast, it says he causes all great and small, rich and poor, and slave to receive a mark on their right hand or their foreheads, that no one may buy or sell except the one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. This is symbolic language. When someone, as scholars have noted, if someone was reading this in the first century when John wrote it, it would be a direct call back to the idea of the Shema, Hero Israel, the Lord God is one in Deuteronomy 6, where you are to bind the laws of God onto your head and to your hand. The idea of your actions, your thoughts and your actions. The mark of the beast is a counterfeit of the seal of God in the book of Revelation. It's a counterfeit. The mark of the beast on the right hand and the foreheads is a direct push of the idea of the thoughts and the actions of a person being decided on a course of action when it comes to their worship. It is not a chip. By the way, I just want to say, if you think it's a, a microchip, how cruel is God? What if someone tied you down and put it into you? Oh well, right? Is it really something physical? I don't think so. It doesn't match up. Rather, notice how the mark of the beast is enforced by the image of the beast. The image of the beast is coercion. It's persecuting. You will take this route or you will be punished for this route. You take the route that we decide or there will be consequences. This becomes problematic for those that have what we call the seal of God. Because the mark of the beast is the opposite of the seal of God. Now you may be saying, what is the seal of God? There are three seals of God. Three seals. Number one, the first seal, as described in Ephesians, describes the work of the Holy Spirit sealing the believer. If you are someone who has accepted Jesus Christ, you are sealed by God. Does that mean that it is an eternal seal? No, it doesn't mean it's an eternal seal. If you want to reject God, I believe you can reject God. But the idea of the seal is that you are sealed. If you have a piece of paper, you fold it, you seal it with wax, it's very difficult to pull that seal apart. I truly believe that if you want to leave God, God is not going to let you go without a fight. He is not going to give up easy. That's the first seal. 
There's another seal in the book of Revelation, which is specifically for those that are alive at the time of the seven last plagues. It is a special seal that is given to them to protect them from the events of the raining down of God's judgment on the wicked. In that sense, it's almost an apocalyptic type seal. That's the second seal. The third seal is a seal of recognition of authority. The third seal is something that's actually not necessarily explicitly stated in the book of Revelation, but is explicitly stated all the way back in the Old Testament. In a sense, the Sabbath commandment itself is the seal that God has put on his Ten Commandments. The seal, and notice the first angel's message that we talked about briefly mentions that seal. Fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come and worship him who made the heaven and the earth, the sea and the springs of water. We talked about that that last part is directly quoting Exodus 20, talking about the Sabbath. The Sabbath itself is a seal of a recognition of who God is. We truly believe that the Ten Commandments were not something that was just given for the people of Moses' day, that the Ten Commandments have been something that had been in place since the fall of humanity, that Adam and Eve were aware. We trace the Sabbath going back to the creation week. Did Moses' people need a reminder of what God had done? Absolutely, they did. But even in a time post Jesus Christ, while Christ fulfilled the law in the sense of the ceremonial ritual law, the Ten Commandments are something different than that. And they stand the test of time. The Sabbath command is something that is to stay with our people, to stay with the people of God. Again, worship Him who made the heaven, the earth, the sea, and the springs of water. The Sabbath is a seal of a recognition of the worship of of God, of what God considers to be His law. By worshiping on Sabbath, you are saying, I am recognizing the authority of the one who made the heavens, the earth, and the sea that is all that is in them. Does that mean that someone is worshiping on Sunday right now, that they're not? No, that doesn't mean that. That doesn't mean that at all. You are not saved by keeping the Sabbath. If someone tells you that you're saved by keeping the Sabbath, you've missed the entire point of Jesus Christ's resurrection and death on the cross. Rather, the Sabbath, we believe, as was mentioned in my first sermon, we believe that the Sabbath itself is something that will become more prominent to light as time reaches its end. That more focus will be given back to understanding, is Sabbath something that still needs to be kept? And I believe, yes, it is. I don't believe that the church had the right to modify divine law and change the Sabbath to Sunday. I don't believe that there is one man who is a representative on earth for God or one seat of power that gets to modify divine law as seen fit. I don't recognize that God has put one representative of him here on earth. That is a rejection. That's why I'm a Protestant. But what you have here this mark on the forehead and the hands talking about the thoughts and the actions, it is a coercive measure that is put forward by the beast, the image of the beast, when church and state in the U.S. come together to follow the pathway of what is considered correct by the state. And it is in opposition to God's commands. It is a false type of worship. Again, the key issue in the book of Revelation is about worship. And at some point, again, we are not there yet. I want to reiterate to you, we have not reached what happens in Revelation 13, 12 and onward yet. That has not happened yet. Are we moving towards that slowly? Absolutely. Absolutely. But it's not there yet. So this idea of the mark is something that is still in the future, but it is something that is made as a conscious choice. But it's also made, by the way, kind of under a threat. Kind of if someone puts a gun to you and says, what are you going to do? You're making a decision, 
but you're coerced into making that decision because you're scared of what the consequences are going to be if you do not take that decision. When it talks about buying and selling, unless you have the mark, some scholars have said that this is figurative language to express the hardships of what it would mean to reject the mark. In fact, in Revelation 18, we see a group of people lamenting the, the, the destruction of end time Babylon because of the economic prosperity and the glory that it provided for them, the merchants of the earth. The idea is the rejection of the mark of the beast is basically putting yourself under a lot of hardship. And the idea is, is that hardship worth it? That's the key question. Is it coercion? Absolutely it's coercion. And that's why for God's people, those that are sealed, right? That's why it's considered a time of trouble. Because the hardships of rejecting a coercive power are not easy. Are not easy. This third angel's message. This is the verse 9. We just kind of covered verse 9 because it's containing all that's happening before in Revelation here. But... There's something interesting that happens in verse 8 of the second angel's message. It says, She has made the nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. End time Babylon is an oppressive type power unless you go along with it. Then everything is peachy, it seems. But notice here in the third angel's message, it says, Following the mark on his forehead and on his hand in verse 10, it says, He himself, one that is being marked, shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. At the end of days, you will suffer. You will suffer. You're going to suffer one of two ways. It is impossible for you not to suffer. You are either going to suffer the wrath of Babylon, or you're going to suffer the wrath of God. You cannot opt out of suffering. Okay? But, the question is, which suffering is worse? What is the suffering? The suffering of the wrath of God is covered later when you get to the bowls of wrath. And the only reason that the righteous people are not affected by them is because they have a special divine seal given to them to protect them from it. The wrath of God laid out at the end of time is so severe that he has to provide a special protection to his people. Versus the wrath of Babylon, which... You don't need a special seal to be protected from. It's probably just as oppressive as any cruel government type organization can get when it comes to persecuting groups. But regardless, you are going to suffer one way or the other. It depends on which one you will go to. The wrath of God, not cup, not uh, mixed at all, is so severe that again, special divine protection is needed. And then finally it says, He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night who worship the beast in his image and whoever receives the mark of his name. This is clearly alluding to the final destruction of the wicked. Again, forever and ever is not talking necessarily in the sense we think forever and ever. The Bible sometimes uses the word forever and ever to describe totality of destruction. It says Sodom and Gomorrah was destroyed are burning forever and ever. If you go to the Middle East right now, Sodom and Gomorrah is not burning forever and ever. But the totality of their destruction is total. What it's talking about here is the destruction of the wicked where they and the devil are destroyed by the holy fire that God rains down after the millennium period covered in Revelation in a later chapter. This is kind of a brief synopsis so to speak so what you have with the third angel's message 
is kind of the end time, I'd say, right before and right after Christ comes. This is the most terrifying, if you want to call it, of the three angels' message because it's talking in an urgent language about the consequences of one's choices. The idea is that you've read the book of Revelation up to this point, and you've been aware of those that are the saints that are sealed, those that are marked by the beast power, and you're seeing which side should I go on? Which side should I choose? And Revelation is not done with that, because following chapter 14, you start to get into those bulls of wrath that I talked about. It's a question about what will you do when you are presented with an option? I truly believe that at the end of times here, people will be able to make a conscious choice for themselves of which system they want to worship. And the Bible is laying out here the results of the choice that one will make. But to close out the third angel's message, there's a message of hope. In verse 12 it says, Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. The patience of the saints and those who keep the commandments of the God and the faith of Jesus. Some versions say the faith in Jesus. Do not be weary if you are following God. It is a time of trouble. We are not, even if you are sealed by God, you are not taken out of the circumstances that are happening around. But it is an assurance that God is with those that are following Him. I want to reiterate, you are not saved because you keep commandments. In fact, somebody could be going to church on Sabbath their entire life and have no relationship with God. Are they saved? No, they're not. You're not saved because of your keeping of commandments. You are saved by your faith in Jesus Christ. But we believe that as time progresses, God is going to make known truth to His people. Because God wants us not to live in the state that we always are in. He wants to reveal light more and more to us to help us walk closer with Him. That is the process of sanctification. But during these end times, it will be a trying time where, again, one will be able to make the choice on their own. But you should find comfort in knowing that if you have faith in Jesus Christ and you are following the workings of the Holy Spirit on your life, that you are sealed. And that seal is not easy to break. Can situations cause one to want to break a seal? Absolutely. Hardships are one of the greatest tests of your faith. The parable of the sower talking about the gospel. There are some that get caught up in thorns and they're choked out. Do circumstances truly reveal who are true believers? Absolutely. Now this language to us, again, is coming in a time of relative peace and religious liberty. But I want you to put yourself inside the shoes of a person that is reading this during John's day during the Roman Empire when there is sporadic persecution happening. For them, they find great comfort in seeing that in the midst of a situation where their neighbors could potentially turn them in, where they may be required to make sacrifice to the emperor to show their loyalty, and they don't, they will receive punishment. It is great comfort for them to know that those who keep the commandments and faith of Jesus, that if we stay strong, God will preserve us. And then they're given a beautiful promise that says, Then I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, Write, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works follow them. Do not be afraid if you have to die. If the suffering that you incur will cause you to die, you don't have to worry about that. Does that mean that you are going to be suffered and killed? No, it doesn't mean that. But what it's saying is that in the face of end time Babylon, in the face of the image of the beast, in the face of coercion, of a choice that you have to make about who you will worship and how you will worship, even though 
the choice may be under duress, you have full assurance that if you lose your life for the sake of Jesus Christ, you are sealed, you are saved. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. This is the three angels' message. This is the end time message for people living in the time of 1844 on where Christ is doing his high priestly ministry in the most holy place. The message, I hope, from these three have shown you that these angels going and proclaiming these messages are done for the people living on earth. These are not messages necessarily just for those that are saved, but it's rather a call to action, a call to realizing the time you're living in, and a call to realize what is truly important. But to also make you aware of what is going on around you. You are not called to look at the three angels' message and say, well, if this is what's coming, let me run to the mountains. Let me run to the country and live there, and I'll be okay from what's about to come. You've missed the entire point of what the three angels' message is about. The three angels' message is about there is time to work. Get to work. And again, what do I do? You follow what Jesus said when he ascended to heaven. Go therefore into all nations, teaching, baptizing. Do the work that the disciples were tasked to do, but realize the time that you're living in. That's what this is all about. Do not be scared about the mark of the beast. Do not be scared when you see religious liberty being threatened. Do not be scared when you encounter persecution, which, by the way, we're in America where we have religious liberty. There are Christians right now across the world that are suffering for their faith. Okay? They're suffering right now in areas where they don't have religious liberty. Let us not think that this three angels message is only for us in America. This is for the entire world. But if you do live in a country where you're not under the threat of persecution just for even speaking about Jesus, you have work to do. Don't get caught up in being a doomsday prepper and miss the entire point of why God has revealed what he has revealed. Because your doomsday prepping, I truly believe, will come to ruin under extreme conditions. So today, as we finish up with the three angels' message, the third angel's message, my rhetorical question to you is this. What are you going to do with the time that you have? What are you going to do about the circumstances that you're in? And what are you going to do when it comes to looking at how things are happening? What is your response going to be? I leave that up to you. But I want to encourage you that no matter the route that you take, whether it's to stay here in the United States, whether it's to go somewhere else, I pray that you still follow the patience of the saints, being that those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus, and that while you have time, you can go and fulfill the gospel commission in whatever capacity you are able to while there is time. Let us pray. God in heaven, the three angels' message is a urgent message. Um, but Lord, it's been almost, it's been about 80 years since it started. And for many of us, we may feel that time moves slowly. 
that God, you should have come quicker. But Lord, the thing is, you know when your time has come, you know when these things will be fulfilled. But Lord, it is not our place to decide when the fulfillment of the angels' messages will take place. Rather, we are tasked with going and being ambassadors for your kingdom wherever we are to call back people into a kingdom that is coming, to realize that the entire calling of the angels is to bring people closer and into a kingdom that is not of this world while there is time. For Lord, this world has been reclaimed by you and it has now started the process of its restoration. And Lord, let us be found in that kingdom and pray for those that are not at the moment that they may also join. In Jesus' name, amen.